Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Thank you very much to the Mitchell House for their generosity. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Usually, when I'm in debate, it's a fresh speaker confronting an exhausted audience. Um, <laughs> this, as you may know, is our second house, or as jazz players say, it's second set, so you be the judge. Um, I thank you for slightly overdoing the southern hospitality of providing English word for my arrival. <laughs> Um, you know what they think about you people, where I come from in the north. <clears throat> you know what they think. <laughs> they think you're all uh, just uh, living in a wasteland of piety and prohibition. <laughs> Snake handling. <laughs> punctuated only by offenses against chastity with domestic animals. <laughs> you and I know better. We know that quite a lot of that's not true. Um, <laughs> When I was in uh, uh, North Carolina yesterday, not a place of great southern hospitality, I was interviewed on a very devout station which asked me about Friedrich Nietzsche, and I said, well, I had my quarrels with uh, Herr Nietzsche. But they pressed on anyway, almost pronouncing his name right as well, and said, well, wasn't it the case that when he was writing his anti-Christian works, he was in the terminal stages of syphilitic paralysis? And I said that I know that many people believe that in his later years that was his problem, wondering where we were going with this. And they said, uh, well, did I think there was any medical explanation for my own opinions? <laughs> <laughs> and then I, knew, then I knew what I already knew, which is, this is not just a difference of opinion. Uh, we're, we're in a kind of a fight here. And uh, we don't have a lot of time to summarize our cases, so I'll be quick, or terse. Um, the case to be made against religion is, at first, a uh, strictly uh, logical one. Uh, our, our brains, as mammals, are so arranged, so formed, that we need to think of ourselves as pattern-seeking. We think and look and try and find shape to matters. Um, for example, um, this city was once burned to the ground amid appalling scenes of carnage, as the result of a conflict in which both sides firmly believed that God was in their camp. Uh, they were both Christian. They weren't even discrepant kinds of Christian, really. It, it wasn't like the Thirty Years' War between Catholic and Calvinist. It was between very similar kinds of Protestantism. Deo Vindice was the motto of the Confederacy. Abraham Lincoln came close enough to say, but not quite saying, that God was on the other side argued that it would be nice to be know who was on God's side. In my view, these are not questions. They may be important to us. We may wish to give ourselves enormous importance and consider ourselves to be the center of events. But God didn't even notice this conflict going on. Not just because there's no such person. As W. H. Auden begins his wonderful poem, The More Loving One, where he says in a phrase that some have a couplet that he, Joseph Brodsky believed could be itself the foundation of a religion, where he says, um, if affections unequal be, let the more loving one be me. If you ever read that poem, it says, looking up at the stars, I know quite well that for all they care, I can go to hell. Uh, religion begins when we don't know anything like that. We look up at the stars and we think that they're arranged for our convenience, and that God put them where they were. We don't know even that our own planet goes around the sun. We don't know about orbits or planetary revolutions at all. But we're still seeking for an answer with no information. We don't know that diseases are caused by microorganisms. We think they're a curse, perhaps, or a punishment. We don't know any of the things we need to know, but we have to try. And just as you'll find today that intelligent people, ill-informed or uninstructed, will prefer a conspiracy theory to no theory at all, well, we're stuck with the first and worst interpretation that our species came up with. Let me put it like this. <clears throat> Let's not quarrel about exactly how long the human species has been on the Earth. It's several hundred thousands of years, at any rate. Apparently, God didn't mind about this at all, took no side in it, took no hand in it, didn't choose to reveal himself until the last five or six thousand of these years. An instant, not even an instant, in evolutionary time. At that point, we are asked to believe disclosed himself and his deep instructions to us um, only in some parts of the Near and Middle East. Eons went by. Humans were born, died, suffered, 
expired of horrible diseases, died in childbirth, fought and killed each other for random reasons. God took no interest at all. Just recently, it's been decided that there should be revelations. Well, now there are some of us, ladies and gentlemen, who simply are not so made that we can believe anything as stupid as that, <laughs> or as simple-minded as that, or as immoral as that. And I stress the immorality because it's not just the case that religion is man-made and is confected by humans to answer sometimes questions that don't arise, such as why do good people die in hurricanes? That's a stupid question. They die because there are hurricanes. We have. We live on a cooling planet which has a turbulent weather system. This kind of thing will happen. Don't worry about why it happens to any one person or another. It's a, it's a silly question. Not just that it's the wrong answer to a uh, non-question, but that it proposes answers that make good people, people of ordinary decency, behave worse than they otherwise would. And this too arises from the man-made character of the belief. If you take the view that God made the man, you would expect to find that the, the worshipping process was approximately even across cultures and preached something like similar morality and similar ethics and had a roughly similar story, discrepant through languages and time and culture, perhaps. But if you make the opposite assumption, uh, because the first assumption leaves too much unexplained, make the, make the opposite assumption that man made God, then it would explain why there are so many gods. There suddenly is no mystery. It would explain why so many of the cults of God are completely irrational, hateful, tyrannical. It would also explain why they quarrel so much with each other and about so little. The massacre of Muslims by Muslims in Iraq, the massacre of Christians by Christians in the Balkans, just to take recent example. 60 seconds. Ha! Um, barely got my trousers off, but I hope that the gesture is promising of uh, future uh, engagement. Um, well, this is, the, this is the principle on which we who say that the secular and the uh, non-believing is both the more rational, the more truthful, the more consistent with the far greater and better evidence that we now possess to explain what used to be inexplicable. And also, I'll just take 30 seconds into I may. To, to claim that, of course, we understand the numinous, we understand the transcendent, we understand the need for music, for poetry, for architecture, for wonder, for awe, for philosophy. We can see through the Hubble telescope more, more marvelous things than the burning bush could ever offer us. And ever since Lucretius and Democritus and Epicurus and the discovery the world was made of atoms and that the gods don't care about us, if they exist at all, they, they're too smart to bother with our quarrels. We have a tradition unfolding through Galileo, uh, through Spinoza, through, through Jefferson, through Einstein. And you who, unlike my humble self, were lucky enough to be born Americans. I only took my oath uh, last month. By the way, I wanted to say this for a long time, my fellow Americans. <laughs> <laughs> and took it at Thomas Jefferson's memorial in Washington by the tidal basin on his birthday and mine, I'm his biographer, realize that you, you don't know how lucky you are to live in a country that says, no, the clergy cannot determine through the state what you may think, what you may do, with whom you may sleep, what you may eat, what you may think, what you may read. Appreciate this. Appreciate the wall of separation that Mr. Jefferson helped to create for you. And join me in saying, before my repast, Mr. Jefferson, build up that wall. <laughs> it's, it's probably worthwhile to simply note at the outset that the proposition before us is God is not great, how religion poisons everything, the title of Professor Hitchens' book. But when, when I was first asked to debate Christopher Hitchens around this book, God is not great, I swallowed hard. I know he can be a little bit caustic in public forums, but I agreed. I assumed I could remain civil and engaged. Even without having seen the volume then, I agreed, went ahead in the spirit of constructive dialogue. But then I started doing the relevant reading and research. It quickly became clear that Mr. Hitchens' opinions represented abomination to anyone like myself raised in an upright home in Louisville. It's a sad thing when you have to judge another human being as fundamentally misguided, even damned. How he can prefer Johnny Walker Red Scott, Happy Van Winkle Bourbon, I do not know. 
As Walker Percy notes, drinking scotch is like looking at a picture of Noel Coward. I don't know what that means, but it can't be good. But... <laughs> While drinking bourbon is a little burst of Kentucky sunshine. Now, interestingly, to pick up on some of Mr. Hitchens' remarks, of course, Lincoln, who believed in God, though he was not an Orthodox Christian by any means, it was Lincoln, of course, who reached out to the South, who said, with malice towards none, with charity for all. And moreover, Auden was a Christian, by the way. And I think his panegyrics to love and forgiveness are exactly the best of the inspiration of the Christian tradition. But let me, having touted bourbon, now say there's no accounting for taste. So I'll confine myself this evening to Hitchens' much more understandable critique of religion. He's wrong there too, but it's a little more forgivable, I think. So Hitchens writes, quote, religion comes from the period of human prehistory when nobody had the smallest idea about what was going on. It comes from the bawling and fearful infancy of our species and is a babyish attempt to meet our inescapable demand for knowledge as well as for comfort, reassurance, and other infantile needs. More specifically, Hitchens criticizes religion, and this is my list, but taken from his book. One, as man-made and anthropomorphic. Two, inspired by fear, schadenfreude, even a death wish. Three, meddlesome. Four, belligerently dogmatic. Five, corrupting of morals. Six, sexually repressed and repressive. Seven, simultaneously servile and solipsistic. And perhaps most importantly, simply false, even disproven. Now, again, it would be interesting to hear from religion whether they can, in fact, be all things to all people in that way. But I would begin my own remarks by saying some version of religion, including organized Christianity, is simply guilty on all counts. I was initially inclined to say guilty, save for the charge of falsity, but religious faith has certainly taught falsehood in the name of God. Everything from the Earth-centered universe to the inferiority of the women, to the justice of race slavery. One has to distinguish, however, between the goodness of God and the failings of religion. Religion as such is not great. It's subject to all the human fallibility, sinfulness of any human activity. Religion as such is not great, but God is. In fact, it's in apprehending or seeking to apprehend the reality of a holy and transcendent God that moves one most clearly to see the devastating impact of human history, human sinfulness, including church history, to be sure. And we have to choose between TV and, and the audience. Fair enough. But here's, here's the kicker. You hasten to add, of course, that both theists and atheists, both the traditional church and the secular state, including, yes, the America that both Hitchens and I love, all of the above are guilty of atrocity. It isn't only pederastic priests or sadistic rabbis who torment children. It isn't only crusading Christians or Islamo-fascists who commit mass murder. Would that it were so, for then we could indeed blame religious conviction for all the ills of the world. But alas, the worm at the heart of human nature goes deeper than that. It touches even scientific rationality, which is clearly Mr. Hitchens' creed of preference. But here's the point. Science itself is anthropomorphic. Science itself is man-made. It will have certain canons of evidence and rationality, but so does theology. Now, not the same, but they're not simply unscripted. Now, here's the point again. Secular values can occasion just as much cruelty as religious ones. Scientific reason can orchestrate just as much bloodshed as so-called superstitious prejudice. We don't need only think of social Darwinism, national socialism, blood and honor of the Nazis. The Nazi genocide was perpetrated with technocratic efficiency in the name of racial purity and the survival of the fittest, the latter being a good Darwinian value. And even liberal democracy can be the rationale for atrocity. We must never forget that in the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, over 200,000 innocent civilian lives were taken and that in the name of a democratic society, our own, and in the name of national defense. Orthodox religion does indeed often poison everything, but so do modern nationalism and postmodern humanism. Sectarian hatred and violence can be seen in Belfast, Beirut, Bethlehem, and Baghdad, as Mr. Hitchens attests, he's been there. But secular hatred and violence have been equally evident 
in Beijing, Buchenwald, Budapest, and Bat Dambang, Cambodia. In fairness, Hitchens anticipates and even concedes this criticism. He thinks it rather undignified for religious folk to make the comparison, but he himself echoes the question, quote, is it not true that secular and atheist regimes have committed crimes and massacres that are on the scale of things at least as bad, if not worse, than those of religion? He grants that some of the most murderous dictators of all time, think of Stalin, enacted their bloody programs in the name of national progress and enlightened atheism. What Hitchens does not come clean on, though, in my view, is on the fact that secular animosity and aggression are not just limited to totalitarian states, nor are they limited to a sort of pre-scientific superstitiousness. In addition to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we should mention the Battle of Bull Run, the Bear River Massacre of Native Americans, the Bay of Pigs invasion, just to stick with the bees. Less spectacularly, just watch contemporary American television to see how tawdry uh, and unjust the worship of self and money can become. Now, in the end, Hitchens averts that the totalitarian impulse is, quote, in essence, a religious one. The history of the 20th century, it seems to me, screams just the opposite. In addition to Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Soviet Union, the quest to perfect humanity in time by scientific means found its most insidious forms in the China of Mao and the Cambodia of the Khmer Rouge, both secular regimes. Again, Christians are certainly not guiltless here. Hitchens documents a number of the connections. But here's another key point. From St. Augustine to Karl Barth, all the best political theologians have warned against elevating any political ideology, any temporal institution to salvific significance or sort of inerrancy. Hitchens dumps on John Calvin's Geneva and the doctrine of double predestination, but as my students know, so do I in class. Not without good reason do we resist some sort of all-knowing predeterministic vision of a world with the, the elect going to heaven, the reprobate going to hell. But what we don't hear from Hitchens is anything about the Christian friends of freedom, the Christian friends of freedom of conscience. Jacob Arminius, Roger Williams, William Penn, Soren Kierkegaard, Reinhold Niebuhr, John Courtney Murray, et al. Here's the payoff. The First Amendment of the US Constitution itself is the fruit of Puritan Christianity. Now, Hitchens agrees with Freud that the religious impulse is finally ineradicable. But I do think he thinks that if only you could get rid of religion, the totalitarian impulse would disappear. Thus, thoughtful Christians, in my view, can justly argue that Hitchens fails to understand, one, the ubiquity of human pride, what the tradition would call original sin, and two, the profligacy of divine grace and forgiveness, what the tradition calls agapic love. Even at its best, religion is an effort to eff the ineffable, a gesture towards the transcendent and holy, an awkward gesture of gratitude towards the unconditional source of all that is. Still, with all its faults, however, so long as the Christian tradition continues to teach that God is steadfast love, and that such chesed, such steadfast love, is to be extended <clears throat> to all neighbors, I will remain myself a willing adherent to it and a defender of it. Thank you. We're going to take about 10 or 12 minutes for a point-counterpoint between our two debaters, starting with you, Mr. Hitchens. Well, now, it won't have escaped uh, your attention, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that the difference between us is narrow, uh, perhaps, but very deep. On what one might call secular questions or ethical questions, we seem to be very much of one mind. Uh, I couldn't really have asked for any more concessions in one speech. Uh, than were just made, uh, many of them quoting myself as if to add uh, uh, honey to the uh, mixture. And I gather that Calvin was wrong in saying that sinners will go to hell. I don't know on what authority you say you don't believe that. And, but uh, then I would never knew on what authority Calvin said he did either. This to me is a non-subject, I, I must underline. However, my presentation, conceited, sneering, English, 
<laughs> condescending. Not at all matched by the extreme uh, modesty, I, may, I might almost say humility, of First Jackson, uh, conceals the fact that he claims to know something that he cannot know. He says, religion may be everything I say, but God is love. I want to know how he knows that. I want to know what his sources of information are. I want to know what his authority is for saying, not just that he knows that there is a God, but he knows that the God is benign and has some sense of what his mind and his intimate details are. I know this much about all my fellow creatures, all my fellow mammals. They don't know that. They cannot know it. It isn't within their capacity, cranial or intellectual, to know it. And my case stands precisely because that's true. I can't prove there is no God, but I can say there's no evidence for believing that there is one. When someone says not only is there one, but they know his mind, his intentions, his nature, they're out of the argument by definition, because they still, because of our culture that privileges the idea of faith, in other words, the willingness to believe something with no reason, uh, can, can come before you and say, well, that's the way I am. I think those people are discarded from the argument at the very beginning. But let me not say that that empties out uh, the professor's case. Uh, I'll take now, in the minutes I have, specifically and directly, his challenge about secular evil. Um, and, and in my book, I have an entire chapter devoted to this uh, refutation, um, available, by the way, at fine bookstores everywhere. Um, <laughs> in Russia, until 1917, uh, millions and millions of Russians have been told for hundreds and hundreds of years that the head of their state, the Tsar, was not just the absolute dictator and ruler of the country, owner of almost anyone in it, but also the uh, head of the church and something a little more than human, if a little less than divine. Picture yourself now, if you can, as Joseph Stalin, a Georgian a conspirator, a thug, and a seminarian who studied for the priesthood for a long time. You shouldn't be in the dictatorship business if you are not able to take advantage of a huge reservoir of servility and credulity and worship that's already freely handed to you by the Christian predecessors and by the devout who have made Russia the swamp and the sink that it is. Of course you're going to erect a regime where the leader is worshipped as if he was supernatural. Of course you're going to have heresy hunts every day to find out who the traitors within the church are. Of course you're going to have inquisitions to torture people into saying things that no one can believe. Of course you're going to announce that agriculture from now on is miraculous and you can have three harvests a year because of the pseudo-genetics of Lysenko. Of course you're going to do that. As, as has been done several times in the attempt to replicate the, the trick pulled by the Christians in the, and the religious in the real world. But you show me a society that has gone wrong and gone to famine and to tyranny and to dictatorship and misery and shame and torture because it followed the precepts of Lucretius and Democritus and Spinoza and Jefferson and Russell and Einstein. And then we'll be on a level playing field. But that's not what my antagonist wants. Thank you. Professor Jackson? Well, I think there was a question in there somewhere, but let me see. Um, you know, first of all, the, the point about does it take religious faith somehow to kowtow to tyrants? This, I fear, is a repeated pattern in Professor Hitchens' comments, as though all religion is somehow foundationalist, a fan of tyranny, and to be rejected as fundamentalist and dogmatic. Number one, in communist Russia, some of the most vigorous, charitable resistors of Stalin were the Russian Orthodox Christians. Number two, he suggests that nobody's going to sort of gone wrong betting on Einstein and the scientists. But you said you said nobody's sort of gone wrong betting on Lucretius, Spinoza, 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 Spinoza Jefferson. Right. Jefferson endorsed slavery. Einstein helped invent the atomic bomb. Does that make them all evil? Not at all. But here's the point: it doesn't take religious belief to cast up evil, genocide, wide-scale devastation. Secular faith in humanity can be just as violent. I call that a draw, in short. But it's not. You know, it's the only persons that are not ignoramuses in Hitchens' book are Darwin, Einstein, and himself. You know, I, 
Now, I'm willing to say we're all sinful. We're all sinful and we can all contribute to horrific injustice, whether we're believers or not. He seemingly would want to reduce it all to religion, identify religion as exclusively that kind of animosity or narrow-mindedness, and then dismiss it, lampoon it. The worm at the heart of human nature goes deeper than that, again. Note, following up on an earlier comment, I never say I know the mind of God. The mind of God is a matter of faith and prayer. When I was going through grad school in philosophy, I was reading Nietzsche, I was reading Freud, I was reading the projection theorists. Like a lot of folks, I thought this universe was all there is in its material temporal form. It was actually seeing a dog get hit by a car that moved me to really completely reverse my view, meaning I was walking in front of the religious studies department one day, just sort of thump in a horrible squeal, turn around and there's this beautiful black lab that has been hit, blood coming from the mouth, staggering, clearly dead, clearly mortally wounded. It sort of staggered around, and I remember thinking, I'm looking at my own death. You know, I too am a mortal creature that will die someday, perhaps in this kind of pain. But to my great surprise, I also had a sense of the absolutely loving presence of a deity also witnessing this, also grieved by it. In short, in that moment, I had a sense of a transcendental goodness that holds this world in being, created it, sustains it in existence, such that I was the projected person, not God. When my students ask me, what's the proof of God's existence? I say, this is the fact that the world exists, that the Big Bang produced space and time out of nothing, and that we are sustained by it. It is, in my faithful view, the echo of that loving act that we experience every day in receiving forgiveness from other people, in giving forgiveness to others. It's not a dogmatic claim of knowledge, but it is a faithful claim based on experience. Mr. Richards? <clears throat> well, I can now add to the ontological proofs, every one of which has been discredited since uh, they were first offered, the Labrador or Retriever theory, <laughs> which I, I'm bound to say, sir, with all due respect, doesn't convince me at all. But I cannot say it didn't happen to you, and I wouldn't dream, of course, of uh, saying it wasn't a real moment to you, and I hope that it was and remains real to you, and I would further very strongly recommend that from here on, you keep it to yourself. <laughs> Just say that you know you have a wonderful creator and supervisor who cares for you and looks out for you, and I hope, I really do hope, that it makes you happy. And it, actually, in your case, it does seem to. In the case of other believers, most others, it doesn't seem to make them happy. Why not, my point to begin with? Why doesn't such a wonderful thought console people? Why do they have to say they can't be happy till I believe it too? <laughs> doesn't that... Doesn't that, among other things, inter alia, argue for a slight insecurity in the original belief itself? The presence of those who won't have it discomforts them. The infidel doesn't make them happy at all. We want you to be happy too. And you know what? We'll kill you as soon as look at you, if you don't. Now, I'm sorry, I, I have to re I return to this point. There are things that no morally normal person would think of doing if it wasn't that they believed in religion or in divine instruction. Take a transcendent experience that I'm sure a lot of you have had. I've had three times. Hold a newborn baby in your hands. I'm a pretty leathery old cynic. This must be evident to you all. <laughs> Nonetheless, if you're ever going to feel that a little miracle has occurred in your life, that a free gift has been given by nature, by the, that's probably the moment likeliest to feel it. It also means you absolutely know, by the way, you're going to die at that moment, and that you have to, in order to make way. Interesting point. I'm, re I'm quite resigned to my own death because I know my children don't want me to live forever. <laughs> and I have to get out of the way. That's just the way it is. And I also make, I hereby also highly resolve, I, won't, I want them to be at my funeral. I don't want to be at theirs. Now I know what I'm doing. So here's this bundle. Look at the little indentations and the earlobes that it's so impressed with, Hicker Chambers and all that. And then you should be getting on with parenting. But no. Uh, first, let's find a sharp stone or a knife and start hacking at the genitalia. 
because after it turns out the design isn't that great. And in a crucial feature too, <laughs> it needs to be sawn away. A lot of it needs to be sawn away. No morally decent person would do this if it wasn't for superstition. Um, I have many other examples, but I think I will leave them. Just on the totalitarian point again, of course there were many Russian Orthodox dissidents. There were, many, there were also very many Marxist uh, and socialist dissidents against Stalinism. In fact, they were the bravest, as they were against Hitler, even though their own ideology has been discredited. It says nothing to the credit of the Communist Party that it's fought against Hitler so much, because it fought on a basis of a false ideology. It says nothing to its credit. I've been in North Korea. I'm one of the very few writers who has been to all three axes of evil countries. Now I know what a truly religious state looks like. Now I know what it's like to praise all day and all night. Now I know what it's like to say thank you all the time to the dear leader and the great leader. Now I know what it's to be like in a real country that's only one short of a trinity. And just you be lucky, you'll never have to find that out for yourself, as long as you stay secular. But tell, tell me again, then, what was the religious inspiration behind Pol Pot and Mao? Well, uh, the religious inspiration of the Khmer Rouge was the restoration of what they call the Ankar, uh, the ancient Buddhist uh, autocracy, unchallengeable millennial oriental despotism. The Ankar was the name, the old Buddhist name, of the Khmer Rouge central authority. Based on that and on Cambodian anti-Vietnamese racism, it's the same with the, the current hideous dictatorship in, in Burma, which I refuse, but, but to, what I, what I refuse to call Myanmar. It's a, it's a, it's a Buddha, it's a a temple building, stupa building, religious theocratic dictatorship as is North Korea. Mr. Hitchens, we'll get back to that in a moment. Well, I wasn't. Right. Uh, you were right. <laughs> but Professor, but here, you know, again, here's the point. If, if we can embrace such doublespeak that North Korea is a religious institution, a religious regime, understand Mao, Stalin, Pol Pot as fundamentally religious, then religion has become an utterly meaningless term. You know, again, it seems to well, me. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're not making it meaningless. You're making it vilified unto meaning that it doesn't bear. And there's a, that's the crucial difference. But back to re reasons to believe, reasons not to believe. In his book, Professor Hitchens notes that Kant falsified or disproved the ontological argument for the existence of God. Existence is not a predicate, Kant argued, so you can't think it can necessarily be applied to a God. But Hitchens doesn't mention that Kant himself embraced the so-called practical or moral argument for the existence of God, fully aware that this was not knowledge, fully aware this was a matter of faith, a matter of morals. But this is sort of an indication of the historical and philosophical accuracy of the book, that it will only hold up something like Kant as anti the ontological and cosmological argument, be totally deaf and dumb about Kant's own arguments, reasons for religious belief. Well, so, um, so who asked now? Oh, sorry. Where are we? Well, why don't we just stay with it like this? I mean, uh, I'm not a Kantian. Um, I don't feel that I have to defend Kant in himself, only the arguments and the reason for which he stands when he's untrue to them. I say that too, or don't cite him uh, in the same way as Thomas Jefferson, living around the same time, uh, couldn't work out why in Virginia the seashells were so high up on the mountains. Nobody could that. He was a deist because the, the furthest an intelligent person could go in skepticism at that point of the century was to a deist argument from design that stopped right there, said there may be a god, but he doesn't intervene in our affairs. He's not so foolish as to concern himself with our trivia, for one thing. Uh, that's a belief in a, a reverence, but it's not a religion. Uh, that, that we were waiting for the great day in 1809 when um, the two men who would uh, complete Jefferson's legacy were to be born on the same day, actually, uh, almost makes me superstitious. Uh, Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin, born on the same day in February that year. One of them was a bit greater emancipator than the other. Lincoln finished Jefferson's critique of slavery, and um, Darwin answered his question about where those seashells come from so high up on the mountain. But you know, Kant didn't know any better. We do. We don't have any excuse for dicking around, excuse me, on this point. We do have a lot better information. We do know a lot now about the nature of our species internally, our kinship with other creatures, our, our origin in common with them, the fact that we have been lucky enough, or not lucky enough, because that's solipsism in itself, uh, to be um, not among the 99.9% .9 of species 
so far to have occurred on this planet who have become extinct. Right? Some design, by the way, of that is that we live on a planet uh, that is the only one that isn't either too hot or too cold, it, just in our speck of a solar system to support life, and very large parts of our planet are too hot or too cold to do that even now, and we live, as we increasingly understand, on a climatic knife edge. What kind of design is this? My point is, if you want to derive ethics and morals from reality, from human solidarity, from actual knowledge of where we stand in relation to the universe, it may not be too depressing to realize that we are, in fact, alone in this. We can't pray supernatural aid. We can't invoke what we don't know. We're, we're arrogant and vain when we do do it. It tempts us into saying that we're better than people of other faiths or other religions. And that if we understood we were all stranded on a rather difficult shore, uh, born into a losing struggle, with every day of our lives being more and more subtracted from less and less, the stoicism of that conclusion might make us turn towards each other in a more interested and definite way and would demonstrate more integrity and would free us from the great retardant of human civilization, the realm of illusion. Professor, sure. last point and then sure. closing remarks. I think a key point to make here is, again, there is a lot to be debated with respect to Darwin, Einstein, evolution, atomic physics. I'm certainly a believer in evolution. But number one, Darwin thought the laws of evolution themselves were designed. What Darwin disputed was that any particular outcome of evolution was God's design. But secondly, again, what I'm trying to resist in Hitchens is this tendency to think that he knows what science has to dictate. I mean, what you just offered is a wonderful sort of principle take. But number one, that's a lot of article of faith there to claim that you know that there is no deity behind it all, that you know sort of what the laws of, of biology mean. I just got back from a conference at Harvard on the evolution and theology of cooperation where some of the most high-powered game theoretical sort of mathematical biologists were in attendance. And interestingly, one of the, the preeminent lights there, a man named Martin Novak, professor of mathematical biology, also head of the, the program for evolutionary dynamics, argues it is important to resist three things, creationism, a you know, sort of young earth view where there's, the, the earth is only 6,000 years old, whatever, but also intelligent design, if that's seen as simply God randomly intervening, a God of the gaps, but also scientific atheism. Novak, and I think he rightly makes the case, is if it is dogmatically presented as something we know is just as much an article of faith and indeed just as dogmatic is the contrary. For what it's worth, Novak is a devout Roman Catholic as well as a, a biologist. He rejects, as I've noted, creationism, intelligent design, scientific atheism. But as he puts it, the God concept of any well-formulated theology is more sophisticated than that. Novak notes that, quote, scientific atheism, it goes beyond an immediate interpretation of scientific results and is itself a religious statement. Nobody's going to get beyond faith here, in other words. Right? I, sometimes it sounds like Hitchens believes that science has unmediated access to the given. And so we can escape human purposefulness, human finitude and faculty, no, science itself is a human creation that will be based on various evidences that will involve interpretation all the way down. Now, you may judge that interpretation to dictate no intelligent design. Fair enough. But don't think that that's the only form of knowledge possible. You know, more positively, Novak argues, for example, quote, an atemporal God who is both creator and sustainer lifts the entire trajectory of the world into existence, he thinks. Evolution describes the fundamental laws of nature according to which God chooses to unfold life. Novak concludes then that, quote, religion is cosmic hope and alone gives ultimate purpose, that evolution poses as little problem for religion as gravity or any other natural force. That, it seems to me, is an intelligent effort to bring together truths of theology, truths of science. Hitchens will not permit any sophisticated form of theology as though that's true faith, or that's at least a defensible faith. What we get, in my view, is what I would call a fundamentalism of the unbeliever, a fundamentalism of the unbeliever, where all religion is dogmatic, unscientific, vengeful, the sort of person who would consign a non-bourbon drinker to hell, 
and yet not sensitive at all to the places in Scripture where tolerance, love of neighbor, gratitude towards God as the source of all that is, whatever you think that to be, is the fundamental motivating factor of human existence. Now, again, I think he's right in thinking there's a lot that brings us together. But what I think still fundamentally differs between us is that I fear he tends to elevate the secular state as though that's the summum bonum. He finds it very hard, it seems to me, to have a purchase on the injustice that the United States of America, even qua liberal democracy, sometimes perpetrates. That is not the only reason to believe in God, that there is a righteous source of goodness even beyond the nation state, but I would submit it's one of the happier pragmatic outcomes of it. The only reason finally to believe in God is that you do and think this finite world depends upon a transcendent source for its existence. But that said, it still seems to me religion is actually a better safeguard of peace, tolerance, and understanding than a secular state. Closing remarks, Mr. Richards? Well, I would prefer to blame myself than President Jackson if I have been so misunderstood by the audience as to have said, or been thought to say, <clears throat> that I can prove there is no God. I appeal to your fairness, your adjudication, ladies and gentlemen. Did I not, in fact, say that I can no more disprove the, the existence than the theologian can prove the existence? Absolutely. Did that not? Did I not? Well, I'm then, an, I feel to that extent less uh, like a fool. Um, the, there is an enormous difference, therefore, between those who say they do not know and those who say that, yes, they do. And not only that they do, but they know it in intimate detail, that they can even say that God is love, or love is God, or that there is a salvation at hand or comfort to be obtained. These are remarks that constitute to me no more than white noise. A Jehovah's Witness could say as much. An Aztec could and did say as much. There's never been a society where people don't say, well, you may not know what God wants, but somehow we do. And though Professor Jackson would not be the ideal exemplar of it, therein lie the temptations to totalitarianism, to the bullying of others, uh, to the coercion of other people into behavior in the here and now, not in the future. Uh, the temptation, in other words, of secular power. Uh, the reason I'm an anti-theist is that I don't wish it was true, as some atheists do. I know many non-believers who wish that this numinous and transcendent thing could be but they can't make themselves believe it. Who can? I don't wish it was true because I have no wish to live in a permanent state of surveillance, supervision, invigilation by an unchanging, unchallengeable, unalterable authority that will coerce me from the moment of my conception until the, the, the last hour of my life and only then let the fun begin. <laughs> in North Korea, the most religious state, the most worshipful, the most faith-based state I've ever seen, you are forced to thank uh, the, the, the dear one, the creator of all things, for everything all the time. You, you have only the right to praise. At least you can die and get out of North Korea. Abrahamists won't let you even do that. This is the true origin of totalitarianism. I find I must make a point about the uh, scotch, uh, other whiskey question. Um, <laughs> I have investigated the president's decision to become a, a teetotaler. Um, I have some authority uh, for talking about it. I've been into it a good deal. For me, I have to say the decision to exchange bourbon for Methodism is unintelligible. <laughs> um, I can only picture that the other way around. But if the president wants to say, because I think he probably is one of those people who shouldn't touch a drop, that, that, uh, that Jesus got him off it. I don't mind. You see, I don't mind that at all. I do not mind that. He says, Jesus got me off it. I know how he got off it. Laura Bush said to him, it's Jack Daniels or me, asshole. <laughs> um, an expression that has been used in secular terms in the state of Texas many times. <laughs> and you do that once more, I'm leaving, I'm taking the kids. This is a secular event a rather banal and rather sordid one. If he wants to invest it with the name of Jesus, that is absolutely fine by me because he doesn't come by my house and say, now, guess what? It's prohibition time. Christians know what you can drink. No, that's all the difference, it seems to me. It's a vital and absolutely 
essential one. Um, on the, I'll just finish on the totalitarian point, because I, I know it's in everyone's mind, and I've devoted the whole chapter of my book to it, to the relationship between spiritual and secular totalitarianism. I think I've indicated why I think that the desire for an all-powerful source of worship and, and thanks is a servile need and, and, and has the origins of totalitarianism in it. I'll just add that it's not correct to describe fascism and national socialism as secular movements. The, the fascist movements of southern and, south, southern and uh, Mediterranean, uh, Adriatic, and Eastern Europe were all of them allies of, it's proxies of, the Catholic Church. Franco, Salazar, Mussolini, all, all of them had a political concordat with the Vatican. The same with the fascist uh, government in, in Croatia, the Ustasha. It, to be an Ustasha member was to be a Catholic. In Hungary, it was the same with the Arrow Cross. In Slovakia, the actual titular head of state of the Nazi puppet regime was a man in holy orders, Father Tisa. Nazism was pagan, it's true, hoped to supplant Christianity with another form of superstition based on Fuhrer worship and German Nordic uh, god worship, but that didn't prevent the Catholic Church from ordering every priest and bishop in Germany to celebrate Hitler's birthday from the pulpit every year until the end. It didn't prevent the church from refusing to excommunicate anybody who took part in the final solution, not till after, long after the war, was a member of any political party excommunicated by the Catholic Church, and that was any Italian who would vote for the Communist Party. Joseph Goebbels was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church, but he really had committed a sin. And you know what it was? He married a Protestant. <laughs> Magda, then you're in trouble. <laughs> does this not prove religion is man-made? I would suggest that it does. Thank you. Even unto death take the, the village of Rochambeau in France, in occupied France, who in their Huguenot community sort of protected Jewish children against the Nazi occupiers. There are a lot of mixed pictures on both sides. Now, here's the point about belief in God. Hitchens said that I claim to know that God does not exist. You may not have said it here, but you certainly say it in the book. That is, it's very clear, you say explicitly, that belief in God is false, even disproven. That's a whopping epistemic claim that seems to me to be not, in fact, betokening the kind of epistemic humility that you and I at our boast, I think, would both want to recommend. I've never myself said that I know God exists or that I know the will of God. If you listen to me carefully, I talked about faith and a belief. Not epistemic hubris, but the effort, at least, of acknowledging human fallibility and limits. Now, perhaps the, the key point of all, Jack Daniels is not a bourbon. <laughs> Jack Daniels is Tennessee sour mash whiskey. It's not bourbon. It's not Kentucky, I'm sorry. The, yes. I can, I can live with it. <laughs> exactly. See, if you want to know the corruption of his mind. But, um, <laughs> But a couple of more concluding points. Just with fairness to scripture, fairness to Judaism in particular, Hitchens writes about the pitiless teachings of the God Moses who never mentions human solidarity and compassion at all, page 100. What then are we to do with Leviticus 19.18? You shall not take vengeance or a bare grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now lest the neighbor be understood as exclusively one's fellow Israelite, other parts of the Pentateuch clearly suggest an inclusive construal of neighbor love. What are we to make, for example, of Leviticus 19.34? The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. None of this is even mentioned in the book. It's as though the worst sort of vindictive violence of Leviticus is all there is to the Old Testament. Take Hitchens' treatment of the New Testament. Christ is sort of dismissed as a deranged prophet. Fanciful wish thinking. There is virtually nothing dedicated to the so-called weightier matters of the law, faith, hope, uh, justice, mercy, and faith. You don't hear hardly anything about Matthew 22, love of neighbor, about service to the poor, about forgiveness. Again, a lot of nasty texts of terror in scripture. But I submit to you, it is not doing a service to truth or the wider liberal state to just turn a blind eye to the countervailing teachings. 
and which are arguably much more central to Christ, much more central to Christ than anything like divine punishment or reward. Christ never makes the winning of heaven the motive, though he did apparently believe in the resurrection of the just. So here's my closing remark. <clears throat> Some consider Christopher Hitchens a courageous anti-fascist and a learned iconoclast, and I'm one of them. I think there are a lot of good reasons to praise Christopher Hitchens. He is indeed a brave and articulate spokesman for human decency, for the strength to identify and surrender false consolations. I especially admire his stand on abortion, on freedom of conscience, including his support for the visiting distinguished professor at Emory, Salman Rushdie. But I believe in the end, in fact, he's not feisty and skeptical enough, meaning he sees the limits of religion but not of scientific rationality and of political liberalism. He evidently also prefers Scotch to bourbon, which is equally absurd. But for Hitchens, as I say, religion is one consistent thing, stupid and vicious, something which does not and cannot advance. Science, on the other hand, seems either to have sprung full grown from the head of Zeus, or rather Democritus, or to have steadily and methodically progressed in discerning objective truth according to universally accepted criteria, of course, unless it's obstructed by religion. But that's simply not a plausible picture of either science or religion. Science does not go from triumph to triumph. We need to talk a lot about alchemy, phlogiston, how we get from there to here. Moreover, as many string theorists, including Ed Witten, the inventor of super string theory, would tell you, a lot of their propositions are not demonstrable by evidence. There are elements of interpretive faith there. You know, in short, the history of science that Hitchens suggests is simply denied by the philosophers of science themselves, Kuhn, Feyerabend, and Rorty et al. Now, why is Hitchens so easy on democracy? Why is Hitchens so easy on science? I think the answer can only be that he's invested too much faith in these two realities. There's a lot to be said against, again, even the dictates of the liberal, liberal secular mind. Don't get me wrong, moreover, I believe in science. I believe evolution is qua speciation across time, well documented. But the question of the mechanism behind it, that eat the teleology in it or not in it, is still much disputed. And it's quite appropriate for religious or non-religious to raise those questions. To be sure, religion has warts, even bloody hands, as I've said. There are racist, sexist, arrogant, even genocidal passages in scripture. I'm no biblical inheritance myself, so I judge those sections to be garbled. Again, no human artifact, neither religious nor scientific, is infallible. But first of all, and most of the time, the overarching biblical kerygma, it seems to me, can be appealed to to use scripture to correct scripture. That is, one can try to articulate a better or worse expression of charity, a better or worse expression of piety. I agree wholeheartedly with Hitchens that the invidious distinction between the damned ineluctably condemned to a permanent hell and the saved irresistibly elected for a post-mortem heaven has caused untold, untold cruelty. There is much suffering in these teachings. Furthermore, Christian anti-Semitism is a recurring disgrace. Yet this sort of us versus them righteousness is what the Jew Jesus of Nazareth came into the world to overcome. Whether you think him divine or not, it seems to me, the message is exactly against the kind of dogmatic, belligerent us versus them mentality that Hitchens equates solely with liberal democracy or, or enlightened science. I myself have elsewhere argued for what I call the disconsolation of faith, hope, and love, away from dogmatism away from cruel claims of vulnerability, away from immortality as a motive for virtue. But it's, here's the payoff, the fallibility of all human discourse and the peccability of all human hearts is bedrock to any religion that I can accept. Where Hitchens and I disagree is on the current ability of any religion to carry truth, goodness, or beauty. He thinks that all religion is the product of ignorance, fear, cupidity, and or malice. He asserts explicitly that religion, quote, cannot possibly get along without great fraud and also minor fraud, unquote. But that's to treat TV faith healers who pimp the gospel for money 
Peter Popoff comes to mind, as though they're on a par with Simone Weil and Desmond Tutu. Is Desmond Tutu a fraud? I hold the true religion cast out ignorance, fear, cupidity, and malice in the name of gratitude for the ground of our being, and in fact is a very good repository of compassion for other people. Is it the only one? Not at all. But I look forward to the day when Christopher Hitchens will fully recapitulate the course of one of his heroes, W.H. Auden, and move from pink leftism to neoconservatism to Christian charity, and then beyond them both. I don't want to hector him with this, though, lest I be preaching. Thank you. I'm going to invoke moderator's privilege to open the Q&A with a question about a hometown preacher um, deeply, widely admired, if not revered here, Martin Luther King, Jr. Mr. Hitchens, at the 4 o'clock session, you made some provocative comments about the Reverend King, in which you suggested, and pardon me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but that he didn't really believe in the Bible that much, but it was a document that he could safely use in the South. Would you talk about that again? Yes. Um, the, there's only one sense in which I would complain about being misrepresented in Professor summing up, which is that uh, I don't at all say that the religious people haven't done good things, but I say with William of Ockham that one must dispense with unnecessary assumptions. You do not need supernatural authority to say that the American Constitution says, and the American Declaration of Independence says, that all citizens of the United States are innately equal. You don't need to say, and God says so too. And very little is added to that if you do say it. And before I go on to Dr. King, I will simply say that the belief that the uh, American Civil Rights Movement had to be and was run exclusively by preachers has led to the empowerment of a tremendous number of mountebanks, charlatans, and frauds as a result. The Reverend, the Reverend Jackson, or the Reverend Al Sharpton, with whom I, with whom I debated uh, the other night in New York. These people simply go to show, as did the Reverend Falwell, the ghastly individual who left us yesterday without being raptured. Um, how, how much you can get away with in our culture, how much evil and nonsense you can talk as long as you can put reverend in front of your name. Who would, who would pay... Who would... In what way does this revolting tub of guts deserve our respect for his being a man of faith? In no respect. A man who would go around saying, the Antichrist is among us, and I can tell you he's already here, he's an adult Jewish male. This is the ravings of a clown. People like that should be on the, on the pavement outside the TV studio, like the crackpot here, selling pencils, <laughs> selling pencils from a cup. He said, come in, Reverend, tell us more. Disgraceful, culturally retarding. Now, the, of the Reverend King, I know the following, that he was a close student of Karl Marx and... Friedrich, uh, Georg Friedrich Hegel, that he surrounded himself with secularists and socialists and communists in his entourage and was not just attacked for doing so, but set upon for doing so by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who sent him letters of blackmail trying to get him to commit suicide. That among those people in that entourage were great black secularists like Baird Rustin and socialists, and A. Philip Randolph, the leader of the Pullman Car Union, who actually were the men who organized the March on Washington. They didn't say, God says black people must be free in this country. They said black people have a right that is already theirs, that is innate. And we're not, we don't have to use supernatural authority. I think that's far better. I think Dr. King honored it in his actual practice. And I'll go further and say that in his speeches, where he, he kept repeating them, he, he had favorite tropes. I've been to the mountaintop, the last speech he made. You can't watch. You can't watch that speech without cracking up, at least not if you're me, any more than you can watch Nina Simone singing that week, The King of Love is Dead. You can't. Leathery old cynic though I am, you can't watch it without cracking up. Even if you know that King had made the mountain top speech, saying, I can't see any further, I can't go any further. Many, many times. It was a favorite of his. Just be glad that he didn't believe in the book of Exodus. Just be glad that when he said, let my people go, that's all he meant. Because if he believed in the book of Exodus, he would say, my people have a covenant with God, and they're allowed to kill anyone who gets in their way. They're allowed to enslave the ones they don't kill. They're allowed to kill all the children except for the female virgins and keep them as slaves for purposes better imagined than described in the name of and by the orders of God, 
in order to steal the land of the Canaanites, having massacred the, the Jebusites, the Amalekites, and the Hivites. We should all be grateful, I think perhaps, perhaps not least since we're met in the state of Georgia, that Dr. King wasn't a Christian in that sense. It's a, it's a work of supererogation. It's superfluous. If you cannot derive human rights from the struggle for rights themselves and you require supernatural support, it seems to me you have no confidence in your own case. And I have complete confidence in the case of human rights and will stand here and defend it and don't feel that I need to say I have God on my side because for one thing, I don't. And for another, I have no right to talk in that tone of voice. And if I did, I would hope you would suspect me. There. <laughs> Professor Jackson, Reverend King, about yes. Reverend King. Yes, yes. As I said at the 4 o'clock meeting, I'm prepared to let this issue be the litmus test on Hitchens' epistemic humility, on what he claims to know or not know, who's being dogmatic, who isn't. In his book, Hitchens argues that because King did not condemn his enemies to hell, he was, in quote, quote, in no sense a Christian. King was a Christian in name only. Indeed, according to Hitchens, quote, he was a profound humanist whose legacy was, had very little to do with his professed theology. I would simply ask this. Can we write off King's own self-understanding so readily? And indeed, how would we know that what he said was what was really moving him when he came back over and over again to the kitchen table epiphany in Atlanta to a sense of God's presence? It was actually during the Montgomery bus boycott. But he would repeatedly say, I can't retreat to mom and dad. I have to have faith in a power larger than myself. And moreover, when in stride towards freedom, King criticizes Marxism, criticizes communism. He does so explicitly announcing a departure from those creeds. Can we really say he was not honest when he insisted that Christ provided the spirit of the civil rights movement, Gandhi, the practice, the, the method? Can we really reject King's writings on agape as the expression of God's nonviolent love that was absolutely crucial for him? Now, don't get me wrong. King may be wrong. Right? There may be no God. It may be that agapic love is simply an illusion. But to say that you know that King was really a humanist would rather be like my saying of Hitchens, because he does not consign his enemies to Auschwitz in the killing fields of Cambodia, he's in fact a Christian. And his atheism really has little to do with his own agenda. It's exactly the same move. You're claiming an absurdly reductionistic account of a view and then rejecting it as the only possible one. Moreover, saying, because King does not consign his enemies to hell, he can't be a Christian. I could just as readily and wrongly say, because you don't consign your enemies to Auschwitz, you, know, you, you can't be a humanist. Only a humanist would do that. So you must be a Christian. It's that sort of disrespect for someone's own self-understanding and, and taking it to be simply a misstatement or not really operative, that, that troubles me. And I think it really does suggest a kind of dogmatism about secularity that can be just as vicious and just as destructive as a religion. I think Mr. Hitchens is, sorry, is, I, is, wants to respond. Well, I think I'm obliged to, uh, given the sudden uh, sub, I won't say southern, downward term. Uh, that the argument is apparently taken. Um, let me give you two small examples of two people very, very celebrated and honored in their own society, uh, Benjamin Franklin and John Stuart Mill. Both of them wrote at length about the, the, the mere sheer fact that they did not dare, they did not dare in the societies in which they live, affirm their unbelief, that it was too risky for them. Men who have great honor and great prestige in societies we know about and understand are within our reach. The victory of religion so far, I haven't mentioned this yet because I thought it was obvious to everybody, is very largely to do with the fact that it could stop anyone and stop them hard if they had any disagreement. And until our own day, it's been considered extremely unwise to make a profession of unbelief. Now, someone like Dr. King, who was in enough trouble already in the South, but did have the wonderful ironic uh, purchase and ability to say, the book that condemned my people to slavery, the book that was used as the warrant for slavery in the first place, the Bible, the Bible which says nothing about civil rights, that does say about the sons of Ham 
And it does say about racial segregation and does mandate genocide and does mandate slavery and did for hundreds and hundreds of years, wouldn't it be a, a work of literary genius to use this book against its perpetrators and shame them? Yes, sure. Wilberforce did the same. But the American Anti-Slavery Society is founded by Thomas Paine, a brandy soaked, this time I know I'm right, uh, deist, and uh, Benjamin Franklin. Um, and many other secularists, and all the anti-slavery societies in all countries are actually founded by non-believers. Um, I repeat, it's surplus to requirements. And the one example, I, would, I, I'm, I know he did admire it, but I, I deplore it in him, and I must say so, uh, is that of uh, Gandhi. If Dr. King admired Gandhi, he made a hideous mistake. The Hindu sectarianism of the man we call Mahatma, that means holy man, it's not his first name, Mohandas Gandhi, ruined independent India caused a hideous partition of the country between Hindus and Muslims, as it had to if the Congress party was going to be led by a sectarian guru, um, and did gigantic damage, as did his vile and disgraceful preaching that Indians should not resist Japanese fascism and imperialism and should resist not evil when it was at their gates, thus not being even a pacifist in a principled manner, but saying, we don't care. He said, leave... The British should leave, leave India to God or to anarchy, which in the circumstances of Japanese conquest would have meant probably both, uh, or, or no distinction between the two, and in the meantime meant he was going to let other people do his fighting for him. A, a perfectly disgraceful example, a man who is responsible for a great deal of suffering by his self-righteous preachings. Same with the Dalai Lama. You may think that he's, he's able to make moral pronouncements because he claims to be hereditary god and a hereditary king. I say that the proclamation that a human mammal is a hereditary god or king is an obscene one, an absurd one, and if such a person should happen to make a moral statement every now and then, it's a coincidence. <laughs> so we can I, I know of no moral statement that I owe to the Dalai Lama. Do you? Will anyone in this audience get up and say, I wouldn't know this was true if it wasn't for the Dalai Lama saying so? But he does say things like, it's okay to jerk off as long as you only use your left hand. <laughs> and he has tremendously complicated views on anal sex. How he knows this, I don't know. <laughs> and this we do not need, because it's a rape of our privacy, and it's an attempt to use the supernatural to make people feel shameful and upset. And without it, we can well do. And out of it, we must grow. And I know nothing about human or civil rights that I owe to any holy book, and I don't believe there's anyone in this room right. who could say different. But note how the subject has changed from what King believed to what Hitchens believes. And I'm with you. I'm with I'm you. Not let's, not let's, let's not, let's not, not celebrate Gandhi to the extent that he was unjust. Let's not celebrate the Dalai Lama to the extent that he's repressed. But here's the point. I will pay enough homage to King's conscience to believe, as he said, that he did revere Gandhi and that he did learn from Gandhi, even as I will respect King's conscience enough to believe him to be speaking the truth about himself when he talks about learning about nonviolent love from scriptures and Christ. To say that you don't need those things is not to say that King didn't believe them. And, and so often, I fear, you, you make the move that he can't believe it because I don't, so he must be a humanist. Give the man enough conscience, and this is what animates me. You can vilify me all you want. But King is not to be simply ascribed that level of bad faith simply because you don't need those things. It's simply says that he was in, he was in He's a, a liar. trained preacher. He was in a very good position to say that Christianity contradicts the uses to which it's put by racists. He was a liar and hypocrite. He was a liar and hypocrite. If well, he we're said, all liars and hypocrites. Wait, you would have to believe, because you're a Christian, that we're all liars and hypocrites. And, I mean, and, and, you're not going to say everyone's a liar and hypocrite except that. Martin Luther King. Don't be silly. I'm saying that the, he, there is a very good, if you want to analyze it, rather than simply take, uh, as you wouldn't normally, because you're a member of a very judgmental faith, everyone at their own face value, I can give you an intelligible reason to, to say why it might be that Dr. King, while having a large number of secular and atheist friends who were the core of his movement in many ways, might yet have chosen to use religious rhetoric. This is not to call him or impeach him in, in the least as a hypocrite rather as a great ironic and literary strategist, which I think that he was. If that isn't an article of faith, that virtually everything King wrote about what truly motivated him was false, hypocritical, 
I don't know what is. And again, this is another one of those where you're gonna have no knockdown argument. But the question is, how do we cleave to evidence? How do we cleave to sort of open-minded conversation that I think we're both committed to? And all I'm saying is, sure, King was a sinner. We had that treasure in earthen vessels like we had all earthen treasures. But to attribute that level of hypocrisy to the man and to say when he says, I only want to do God's will, I'm first of all a black Baptist preacher, and moreover when he insists, I'm not even first of all a civil rights activist or rejecting the Vietnam War, I am first of all a servant of God. To say that all of that was simply for political purpose, for sort of expediency's sake, that called, that's a massive epistemic hubris on your part. It's a massive epistemic hubris to claim that you know that and that you would, attri and they would attribute to that to King is, is insufferable. Go ahead. I was going to ask to let the professor finish. Yeah, and it, you know, it well, okay, I'm going to finish again, but he has said this five times. I'm, I'm going to have to appeal to the audience and do you want to hear him misrepresent me again? Did I say this? No, I didn't. Uh, professor Jackson, please finish. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm partly referring to the finish book, I'll, I'll admit. I'm, I'm partly referring to the book, and I can give you page numbers if, if you want them. It's page 176 where he says exactly this, that because King did not consign his enemies to hell, he was not a Christian, etc. But again, let it turn on this. Let it turn on what Hitchens has actually said about King and how he claims to know it. I am going to be foolhardy enough to think that we may get to one more question. If uh, both of you will agree to give very brief answers. Um, here's the question. Can belief in God, Professor Jackson, and belief in the Big Bang Theory coexist? Absolutely. And you're looking at a person in whom they do coexist. I do think the Big Bang is a very interesting hypothesis about the beginning, not in space and time of the world, but of space and time themselves. And even though it's not necessarily a biblical view, it certainly has had some currency in Western theology that creation is ex nihilo, and this view resonates with that. You know, again, I, I don't want to defend a highly metaphysically freighted view of God in which I claim to know dogmatically all of God's attributes, but one can talk about a faith in that causal principle that brought the Big Bang into being out of nothing. There was a singularity. You know, and scientists themselves will acknowledge that there can be sort of no proof for this. The further you go back in history, the more the laws of physics break down, the closer you get to the Big Bang, the more it is a singularity that can't be explained even in scientific terms. So there's a lot of, a lot of resonance there. You know, moreover, interestingly, uh, I do know, however, that there are membrane theorists out there who are now assailing the Big Bang theory. There are membrane theorists who think our universe came about through the collision of two infinitely extended membranes, such that, in fact, we're back to a kind of steady state view where there is an infinite number of membranes, all of which have different laws of physics. All I would say is, which takes more faith to believe in an infinite number of infinite and eternal dimensions, all with their separate laws of physics, or to believe in a causal God who ineffably started it all? Maybe both, maybe neither, but the point I'm trying to make is there comes a time in both science and faith where you have to acknowledge that you're going to depart from the evidence. Mr. Hitchens, can a belief in God and the Big Bang Theory coexist? Well, as I say in my book, a religious belief is compatible with any other kind of belief. It's just that we live now in a period, this is the whole point of my introduction of the first two chapters, we've lived now for a long time in a period where religious belief is optional. It can't be mandated anymore. It doesn't explain anything that we used to find inexplicable. Believe it if you like. It's actually said by Omar Khayyam in the Rubaiyat, in the Fitzgerald, not Fitzgerald, the Legalia in translation. He says, and do you think that under such as you, maggot-minded, starved, fanatic crew, he's addressing the mullahs, God gave a secret and denied it me? Well, well, what matters it? Believe that too. <laughs> you can believe with me that this earth is a penal colony and lunatic asylum <laughs> used as a dumping ground for the rejects of higher civilizations. If you believe in the argument from, for desi from design, you have to admit there's a lot going for my theory. <laughs> and you may not disprove it. It cannot be disproved. It's fine. You can be a Mormon and be a physicist if you wish. It's just, it's optional. You cannot say physics confirms your Mormonism. No one would even try it. 
Um, the, the dilemma remains uh, for believers just what it was before Darwin, before Einstein, before Hawking. Uh, there is no possibility of demonstrating a first cause or even postulating one that does not lead to the difficulty of the cause of that first cause and thus to an infinite regression. All arguments from design and from first cause fall immediately victim to that fallacy. So the belief in God is compatible with belief in absolutely everything, including Satan worship, including pederasty, including fascism, including anything you wish, uh, including flat earthery. Of course, by all means, believe it, but don't, 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 don't try and make me believe it too. Um, Keep I it to yourself. <laughs> Ladies you and gentlemen, can. Can, I, can I have one last gesture of uh, 30 of seconds, you got 30 let, seconds. Let me, let me give, this is Pappy Van Winkle, 20 uh, year bourbon. It's true. Brothers under the skin. <laughs>